Now, from CBS4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy, and welcome to this live one-hour special election edition of Facing South Florida. On today's show, we will take a closer look at the proposal to increase the sales tax in Broward County by a penny to improve transportation. We will also examine Amendment 6, billed as a proposal to guarantee the rights of crime victims. And we will also get the very latest on the race for governor and senate. But we have to start with the events of the last 72 hours. On Friday, Cesar Sayoc, a, a South Florida man, was arrested, accused of sending bombs through the mail to prominent Democrats, including former President Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, former Vice President Joe Biden, and the Democrats' 2016 presidential nominee, Hillary Clinton. All of the packages had return addresses of Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and in fact, the package addressed to Eric Holder was returned to Wasserman Schultz's office. You know, this is a time when no matter what your political persuasion is, we need to turn the volume down. We need to have a civil discourse. We need to be talking with one another. I regularly reach across the aisle to my colleagues, work with them on a daily basis, play softball if, you know, to help breast cancer survivors on the same team as my female Republican colleagues, because they're not the enemy. And none of us should be t treating our opponents like they are the enemy. The van Syak was apparently living in was plastered with images of Donald Trump praising his leadership. But more disturbing were the pictures of Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and others with lines drawn through them, or with crosshairs drawn over their faces. This van seemed to be both literally and figuratively parked at the intersection of our politics today. And then on Saturday, we have the carnage in Pittsburgh. Proclaiming all Jews must die, the alleged gunman, Robert Bowers, walked into a synagogue and killed at least 11 people. This is such a gentle place. I mean, Fred Rogers and Mr. Rogers' neighborhood went to our church. We, this was the neighborhood of that TV show. And to think that, um, that in a place where you would love your neighbor, this would happen, it's just, it's just horrible. And this is just so hurtful. And sadly, not surprising, given the level of hatred towards racial and religious minorities in this country, this was something that I'm afraid that was going to happen. Bowers was taken into custody after a gunfight with police. Investigators say Bowers promoted the conspiracy theory that Jews are behind the caravan of immigrants coming from Central America. Joining me now to discuss this is Patricia Mazze from the Miami uh, from uh, the Miami Bureau Chief. <laughs> I'm sorry, I want to go to the Miami Air. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Bureau Chief for the for, Mi for Miami for New York Times and Mark Caputo from Politico. Sorry for screwing that up. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. It is you? early. I know we'll be doing the form report later. <laughs> but let's let's turn back to the events of the last 72 hours. It's it's a remarkable thing when you have this sort of level of crime and hate seeming to, as I said, intersect in some degree with our politics. Mark, what do you make of the last 72 hours? I guess what's shocking to me is I'm not completely shocked. There's, so many people are unglued, especially on social media, which gives us kind of the chance to break off into our different warring tribes. That almost seems like something like this would have been inevitable. But what is interesting, at least in the Miami portion of it, or the South Florida portion of it, is the Miami Republican Party, or the Miami, G Miami Day GOP, they've had kind of two black eyes in a row within as many weeks. I mean, you, you not only had Cesar Sayoc, who's a Miami Dade registered Republican, getting busted for making these bomb threats, but then uh, the week previously, there was a, a rather aggressive and kind of scary protest of Nancy Pelosi when she showed up at Donna Shalala's office. And uh, the, the Miami Day GOP chair actually had to apologize for what other Republicans, including Marco Rubio, called a mob scene. Uh, Patty, I want to be careful because I don't want to draw a direct line to suggesting that the, the president is responsible for any of this. He's not. But this, this idea of his comments yesterday talking about how we need to maybe what the answer to this is, is stationing more people with guns at synagogues and other institutions like that. Uh, how do you think this, this comes across and what do we do at this point in our society? You know, I kept sort of flashing back yesterday to covering the shooting in Charleston a couple of years ago because the worst sort of crime is a crime in a house of worship. And I noticed several stories wrote that the synagogue's doors were unlocked. It's like, well, that's not surprising. That is what houses of worship are. They're welcoming places. Why would the doors be locked, you know? 
the idea that we have to live in a society where that would be the norm um, would really change, I think, the way we've we've thought of ourselves, right, as a as a country. And it's hard, I think, to draw political conclusions. I've been writing about uh, Mr. Sayak for the last couple of days, and um, you know, the Republican Party said they don't know him from the events campaign events, that he wasn't like an active member or anything like that. That doesn't mean he didn't show up. Who knows, right? But, um, you know, we're a week from an election almost, and, you know, this has to sort of weigh on everyone's mind. I don't know what that weight is going to lead people to do, how they're going to vote. Um, but it do they feel the president is being picked upon, and so it generates excitement among Republicans? I don't know. Does it does it turn certain voters off? I actually had a chance yesterday to, or early, or actually it was last week, late last week, talk to Anthony Salvanto. He's the uh, CBS News pollster, and he's been doing some polling recently on the impact of Donald Trump in elections across the country and here in Florida. And here's a little bit of what he and I discussed. Here's what he had to say. In midterms, we've typically seen about 55 percent, maybe a little higher than that, say that the president is on their mind when they go to the polls, even for Congress. They're voting either to support him or to oppose him. In the polling right now, we're seeing those numbers at record levels, where you've got even larger percentages, even 7 and 10, who say that either to support or to oppose President Trump, that's what's on their mind, even when they're voting in these local and these state races, Jim. So I think that's one of the big, big factors that we're going to watch over the next uh, over the next week. I think events of the last, and this was even before the synagogue shooting, this conversation. I think this just amplifies this as to what this election is about, even on the local level, that pr the president, one way or the other, your views of him, how you see him fit into these these events of the last 72 hours may shape your the way your intensity of how you vote. Yeah. In the end, it's not that much of a surprise. Midterms are generally kind of a referendum on the president. What's different about Trump is he's actively made it about himself, or perhaps he already knows it. And I don't recall seeing a president campaign this much in a midterm, obviously, when he's not on the ballot. All right. I was going to say, I interviewed some voters on Thursday, so before some of the, the arrest and the, and the shooting, and it was striking how many we're voting sort of straight party line one way or the other, Republican or Democrat, and citing the president as their reason. I mean, I'm voting because I'm supporting the president, I'm defending him, or I'm voting because I'm against the president, so I'm voting the other way. Um, I didn't see many split ticket voters, which I just thought was interesting. Just one anecdote. But. Yeah. Um, let's turn to some of the races. Let's turn to, to the, the governor's race. Um, we had, it seems like it was forever ago, but in the last week we had two debates, one on Sunday and then one more recently on, on Wednesday. I want to I wanna play one of, the, one of the, the, the bites, which has to do with the whole controversy surrounding Hamilton and the, the issue of whether or not the, the Mayor Gillum is under investigation, the rest of it. Let's play, let's play that Hamilton bite. He wants you to believe that he's not under investigation. Why would an undercover FBI agent pay, pay, posing as a contractor give him a $1,000 ticket to Hamilton? But I take responsibility for not having asked more questions. But let me tell you, I'm running for governor. Uh, in the state of Florida, we got a lot of issues. In fact, we got 99 issues, and Hamilton ain't one of them. <laughs> A good line, but I'm not sure that he's put this issue to rest, especially because more documents came out, Mark, on Friday that sort of highlighted a, a possible fundraiser that was paid for, sponsored by the you know FBI Mike, as we now know him, the undercover agent. Right. This has played kind of perfectly in Ron DeSantis's hands. The advertising for the Republican Party of Florida and Ron DeSantis has been heavily negative against Gillum, and it's featured this, and then all of a sudden this came about. Important to note that the the lobbyist who is kind of at the center of this part of the controversy has hired as a lawyer Chris Kyes, who is a longtime Republican and who kind of knows the game. And he's and he ran for office. He's running for he, office. Well, he had run for office right. before, yeah, years ago. But he's slowly been releasing these documents just in time. Now, he says it's partly a coincidence that it was the State Ethics Commission that requested these documents, and so he decided to release them. And I said, well, why release them now? He says, well, they're eventually going to come out. But also, it's coincidentally about two weeks before an election. Uh, Patty, I know that with the New York Times, you've written about some of these controversies surrounding uh, uh, Andrew Gillum, the Maritime. What do you make as how this is playing as we head into these final weeks? Maybe as many of, as a third of the vote has already been cast, though. His campaign is trying to say that this is old news because the trips involved were sort of reported on by the local paper in Tallahassee, the Tallahassee Democrat. But here's the thing. 
Andrew Gillum wouldn't answer questions about it a year ago. Now, granted, his campaign at the time was not in a great place because this FBI investigation had come up, and so he was losing sort of donors and support. So he was probably not eager to keep talking about it at the time. But he was asked about Hamilton in 2017. He decided not to answer questions about it until September of 2018. And so it's an issue now. And maybe he wasn't sure he was going to be the nominee and maybe thought it was going to go away. But they have known about this for a while. And to sort of pretend that it's old news asked and answered, maybe voters don't care, quite frankly. I mean, you know, we're talking about a show ticket. And there are certainly bigger issues around, and that it's is the Gillum's relationship. Point. But it's the idea that the relationship with well, with and it's lobbyists new because it's right. new, right? Just right. by definition, it is new, and they don't want to be off of their message in the last couple of weeks. And I think that's why he hasn't really been wanting to answer a whole lot of reporters' questions over the last couple of days. So they're going to be about this instead of their closing message. Mark, you, we just real quick, ten seconds before we go to break. You've been chasing him. You've actually tried to interview him a couple of times on this, and they've steered him away from you. Well, I'm not chasing so much, but yeah, we we thought he'd be available when he was in Miami, I think on Thursday, and uh, he wasn't at one event, and the second event, tried to catch him, and well, the advance guy at one point told me I wasn't allowed to stand where I was standing or even ask a question. Obviously, I ignored the advance guy. But at that point, at least, Gillum had answered the question, yes, here was the J-Bay concert it I'd seems gone almost to. Like, it seems almost like they're trying to just sort of run out the clock as best they can between now knowing every day Hundreds of thousands of people are turning out and voting. Seems to be. All right. All right. We'll come back. When we up next, we'll continue our conversation on this year's elections with Patricia Mazzei from the New York Times and Mark Caputo from Politico. We'll be right back.